Hello class. Um, today we're going to look through the actual My View book using the poetry selection in there, The Butterfly Eyes and Other Secrets of the Meadow by Joyce Sidman with illustrations by Beth Croms. And I know I used some of this poem some of these poems in an earlier lesson, but I thought that today we would use it and take a closer look and I'd have you actually interact with the text doing a close read. So I can instantly, first things first, look at this and I can see the short lines that aren't, that are not sentences and I can tell you from that right away, that's a poem. It's a poetry book. It's a poem, right? Because I just see two words then down to the next line and only three words, short words, short words. Those are not sentences. Those are lines in a poem. So instantly you can look at that and realize it's going to be a poem. And remember one of the aspects of poetry or elements of poetry we talked about was repetition. And repetition draws a reader's attention and adds emphasis to a topic. So I want you to underline the repeated related words that make up the central image of this poem. All right, bubble song. Beautiful bubbles, bubbles of pearl, all in a clustery bubbly swirl. Bubbles I blow from my own bubble spout. I'll never, I'll never, I'll never come out. Beautiful bubbles, bubbles of foam. Bubbly castle, snug bubble home. Keeps my skin tender, saves me from drought. I'll never, I'll never, I'll never come out. Beautiful bubbles, bubbles of spume. Guard me and hide me in my bubble room. Until I'm a grown up and wings fully sprout. I'll never, I'll never, I'll never come out. What am I? Okay, page 343, Sap Song. Once again, I can look at this and I can go, wow, that's, that's got to be a poem. Look, there's only three words, three words, three words, three words. And it's interesting that the lines are arranged like that in kind of two columns and they shift from left to right. And I also notice that some of the lines end with rhyming words. That's a common element of poetry, right, guys? We've talked about that. So what I want you to do is underline the pairs of words that rhyme on this page or on this poem. So sap song. I go up, I go down, from the roots to the ground, like a twin set of tubes fetching water and food. And each stem that you see, there's a little of me. Up and down, like an ant, I'm the veins of the plant. What am I? Then I can tell right here that this is different from the other what we just read, right? So I can see it's an informational text. But I see that it connects to the poems we read. So I'm going to pay attention to these parts to see if they can tell me more about the poems. Because maybe I don't know what the poems are about. And it's Spittlebug and Xylem and Phloem. Have you ever seen a small glob of foam on a meadow plant? Inside that glob, you'll find a one eighth inch long spittle bug, the nymph, young form of an insect, also called a frog hopper. When spittle bugs hatch from eggs, they latch onto stems and suck sap from the plant. In the spittle bug's body, the sap is mixed with chemicals, then excreted and blown into a froth with a special nozzle on the tip of their abdomens. Until midsummer, when the spittle bug matures into an adult frog hopper, it snuggles in its bubbly home, protected from predators, parasites, heat, and strong summer sun. Spittle bugs suck primarily xylem sap, the sap that comes from a plant's roots. The xylem and phloem vessels are like the veins of a plant, carrying nutrients back and forth and helping to support the stem. Xylem tubes carry water and minerals upward. Phloem tubes carry the sugary food made by the leaves to all parts of the plant. So, on this page, page 344, I want you to highlight information that combines with the repeated words in Bubble Song to help you form a mental image. What words help the repeated words in Bubble Song form an image in your mind? And on page 345, I want you to highlight the phrase that helps you picture the parts of the plant that the author describes in the rhyming lines of Sap Song. And as I scroll down here to read to you guys, I can see 
the structure here tells me we are back to poetry, right? And as I read this poem heavenly, I'm going to look and listen for figurative language or words and phrases that mean something beyond their everyday definitions. Remember, figurative language, and that's something we're going to talk about a lot this week in regards to poetry. We're going to talk about metaphors and similes. And remember, metaphors and similes compare to unlike things. A metaphor does not use like or as, but a simile does use like or as. And for heavenly, I want you to underline two metaphors in this poem. Remember, metaphors do not use like or as. Heavenly. My pods are famous, of course, soft green purses on sil slim racks. And my leaves, monarchs adore them. They plant their babies and just fly away. But have you ever seen me bloom at high noon on a midsummer's day? When the pavement is steeped in heat and cicadas are screaming, follow my heady perfume and you will track me down. See my heavenly lavender muffins baking in the sun. What am I? So you should have underlined met two metaphors on that poem. On this poem, Ultraviolet, I want you to pay attention to and listen to the word patterns, repeated sounds, similes, metaphors, and imagery that help bring this poem to life. And I want you to underline two similes. And similes use like or as to compare those two unlike things. Ultraviolet. The eyes of these flies see more than we see. They love scarlet, adore pink, thrive on orange, lap up yellow with long curled tongues. But their favorite, extra special secret, color sprinkled on tiny wing scales like valentines and painted on the most delectable blossoms like bullseyes that we can't see because our eyes are not theirs is ultraviolet. What are they? I think, the, I think the picture there kind of gives it away what they are, huh? And now I can see that we're on page 348, and we're back to an informational text piece here. And what I want you to do is I want you to underline the context clues here that help you define the word toxic. Right here it says toxic. What does toxic mean? Remember, context clues are words that are somewhere else around that, the, the base word, the word you're trying to define, they can help you figure out its meaning. So milkweed, milkweed is best known for its fluff-filled sea pods, but it is actually named for its milky sap, which is toxic to most insects and animals. Monarch butterflies are immune to these toxins and lay their eggs on the plant's leaves, which provide food for newly hatched caterpillars. By munching on milkweed, monarch caterpillars and later butterflies become bitter tasting and even poisonous to most predators who have learned to avoid them. Now on that page you should have underlined context clues to help you figure out the meaning of toxic. On page 349 I want you to highlight evidence that combines with the similes in ultraviolet to help you picture the world as a butterfly might see it. Butterflies serve a vital role as pollinators of meadow flowers. To attract them, flowers such as daisies and cone flowers are colored with eye-catching ultraviolet patterns that surround their pollen-filled centers. We can't see these patterns, but f butterflies can. They have one of the widest range of, ranges of color vision in the animal world. For them, ultraviolet colors, which also show up their wings and help them identify each other, are like a secret language. And I'm scrolling down here, and I can tell you that this is a poem, right? Because it's not structured like that. But it's also, it, it kind of has an interesting structure. Some of the lines are long, some are short. I also see that some single capitalized words in the middle of the poem. And I want you guys to listen to how this uh, structure makes a poem sound. So the great ones. We are the tall ones with crowns of velvet, the high steppers, the flag wavers. We are the silent ones that browse at dusk, the bud nibblers, the ear flickers, the gray ones that linger at wood's edge, swift still, here gone, eyes of glass, hooves of stone. We are the ghosts of those who have come before, the gray ones leaping, gone. What are we? 
I want you to underline the lines that contain four syllables and share a rhythmic pattern. Remember, syllables uh, go back to your early days of schooling for syllables. So, you know, a name, my name, Jeremy, has two syllables. Jer me. I'm going to tell you right now, the high steppers has four syllables. The high steppers. What are the other lines that have four syllables and kind of have the same flow as this sentence, the high steppers, or that line, the high steppers? We are waiting a pantoum. What's a pantoum? Pantown? Pantoum. And I look at this poem, and I, can, I notice that it's organized into one, two, three, four. Four, four line it's five four-line stanzas. There's five stanzas. Each has four lines. One, two, three, four. This is uh, an interesting structured poem, actually, guys. And a pantoum is, it features stanzas with four lines. The lines are repeated throughout the po uh, poem according to a set pattern. And what I want you to do is I want you to underline the pair of repeated lines in these first two stanzas. We are waiting. Our time will come again, say the patient ones. Now is meadow, but not for long. Say the patient ones, sunlight dazzles, but not for long. Seedlings grow amongst the grass. Sunlight dazzles and the meadow voles dance, but seedlings grow amongst the grass. Grass, forest will return. Meadow voles dance where once was fire, but forest will return, we wait patiently. Once was fire, now is meadow, we wait patiently. Our time will come again. What are we? And we're back to just normal text structure sort of thing, right? Uh, deer and trees. Informational text, sorry. Meadows are formed in many different ways. Sometimes the forest burns and is blown down or is cleared for lumber, leaving open areas. Sometimes a pond or wetland dries out. Meadow plants move in and thrive in these open areas. Then come animals such as white-tailed deer, which feast on new root shoots, shrubs, and berries, but can fade back into the forest at any sign of danger. This land is always changing, however. Tree seedlings take root in the meadow, and the slow march toward forest begins again. This constant change in habitat is called succession. And there you have it, guys. That's, uh, that's that book of poetry. Um, now, please see this seesaw activity to figure out how to mark it as completed. And like I said, this week we're going to really pay attention to figurative language and how it ties into poetry. All right.